Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Spindle, and I have the pleasure of welcoming all of you today and our special guests who will be introduced momentarily by our moderator, Bonita Sussman. Just before we begin, I want to ask that everybody remain on mute except for our speakers. I'm the president of Kulanu Canada, a small national Jewish charity based in Toronto, founded in 2014 with a twofold mission to educate Canadians about Jewish communities around the world, those in particular that are isolated, emerging or re-emerging communities that wish to learn more and be part of the global Jewish world. Secondly, and most importantly, our mission is to help those communities to achieve their desire for education, connection, acceptance and sustainability as Jews. Some of us came to this work as a result of learning through Kulana US, and a former local Jewish diversity committee in Toronto that was very much assisted by the US organization. The US charitable organization was founded in 1994 and has assisted a large number of communities around the globe with very creative programs that vary from student rabbi placements to Judaic courses delivered online to fully fledged Bet Dins traveling to provide kosher conversions to groups of people in far flung areas of the globe. Kalanam has been a leader in building trust with its sensitive response to requests, its out organized outreach, its fundraising and financial accountability, and most importantly, its commitment to accept and respect communities, no matter what denomination of Judaism they choose, allowing each community to define the Judaic practices for themselves. The larger Centre Congregation of Toronto is our third partner today, and you will learn about this shul's uniqueness when you meet their very unique rabbi. The Lodger is a conservative synagogue, fully egalitarian, founded by Holocaust survivors from Lodz, Poland. This shul began as a mutual aid society for a few survivors, expanded to 90 families over 55 years ago, and eventually established a formal organization and built a synagogue. This community has been singularly supportive of Kulano and other small nonprofits that collaborate to offer programs in their warm and lovely facilities. So when I learned that Rabbi Ali Karant was thinking of visiting the Jews in Ghana and we had held programs at the Lodger, I thought we needed to make a shidduch. Before he traveled to Ghana, Rabbi Ali agreed to represent Kulano Canada and to acquire a few dozen of their magnificently beautiful challah covers. And in this way, we now in Canada sell them through Kulano as does Kulano in the US. This provides further financial assistance to the community in Sefwi Wawaso. I will show you some of these covers um, at the, uh, during the program. And if you wish to contact us to acquire one, you can contact me directly for Kulano Canada or go to the kulano.org site in the US. Before I turn the screen over to Bonnie, one last pitch. We are charitable organizations eager to provide more support to the various communities that ask for assistance and identify as Jewish, some from ages past, such as those in Southern Italy, Ethiopia, Suriname, Nigeria, and some very recent, such as the communities in Indonesia, the Philippines, Pakistan, Madagascar, Papua New Guinea, and, and uh, Kenya. There are many more that have benefited from Kulano's incredible volunteers and resources. In Canada, we're still very small, but we've helped the Jews of Suriname, Southeast India, Ethiopia, and Ghana. And we welcome your support so that we can do much more. In these challenging times, when we can't be sure what turns the economy will take, your support is needed now more than ever. Each community has immediate needs, and some of these needs are of an emergency nature. We thank you in advance for whatever you can do to contribute and assist with any financial needs of these communities. We appreciate every donation, whether you can donate $18 or thousands. In each case, we hope that you will provide support so that our work can continue. And we thank all of you in advance. And thank you very much for joining us today. It's now my pleasure to invite Bonnie Sussman, Vice President Kulano US to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Andrea, for asking me to moderate this discussion. I hope you'll all find it interesting and exciting and find out things about emerging communities that you never dreamed of. Um, I'd like to introduce first, Gabrielle Zilka is, 
is an awarding filmmaker born to a family of funny neurotics in Montreal, whom she credits for her love of storytelling and addiction to carbs. Gabrielle is, a, is passionate about telling stories with heart and humor. Outside of doing Jewish A Story from Ghana, Gabrielle carries other notable credits. Most recently, she wrote and directed the documentary Fear feature, Queering the Script 2019, about the rise of queer fandom and LGBTQ plus representation on scripted television. She also directed the CBC digital series Queer Self Portraits and the short comedy Stop Calling Me Honey Bunny 2013, which was shortlisted for the Iris Prize and the recipient of multiple festival awards. Passionate about equity and promoting diversity in the media industry, Gabrielle previously served as the program director at POV, an organization dedicated to helping youth from underrepresented communities breaking into the media industry with free training, mentorship, and job placement. Currently, she is volunteering with the newly formed Producers Association and advocacy group Impact. I hope you have watched the movie Doing Jewish, A Story from Ghana. In case you haven't, it can be rented on Amazon and YouTube. Rabbi Eli Karant was born in a, into a dissident family of religious refuseniks in Soviet Russia and grew up an enemy of the state. At the age of 15, his family was traded for American wheat and allowed to make Aliyah. His rabbinical and secular degree studies took place in Israel, both before and after his military service. In 2002, he came to Canada to take over the pulpit of Niagara region based in St. Catharines, Ontario. 11 years later, he and his family moved to Toronto. It was around that time that Rabbi Eli established his own tour operation company for kosher geographic travel worldwide. One of his passions is connecting with Jewish communities and cultures around the world. He visited synagogues and Jewish centers in over 100 countries on every continent in the world, barring the Antarctic. Rabbi Eli lives in Toronto with his wife, Irina, and their two daughters, Rachel and Ariel, and serves as the rabbi of the Ludger Center congregation that was established by Holocaust survivors from Poland. Shmuel or Samuel Tete. Shmuel was born in Osefo, Ghana, the middle of three children. Today he is married and has two young children and they are all part of the Tiferet Israel congregation of the municipality of Sefwi Wiaso. Sefwi Wiaso was the first capital of Ghana. Tiferet Israel has a membership of 60, which includes the children. If you saw the movie doing Jewish, the Jews of Ghana, you will know how there came to be such a community, but today you will hear more directly from the community's chazan. Shmuel completed college and is a practicing and medical laboratory technician. In 2014, he converted to Judaism and in 2018, he became the chazan and his services include prayers and songs in English, Hebrew and the local language of Sefwi. Shmuel is self-taught and he is one of the teachers bringing Judaism to his community, including the liturgy, reading Hebrew and studying Judaism. I am pleased to welcome Shmuel and call upon him to be our first presenter. I will, I will have all panelists present before we take questions and then you can write your questions in the chats that are available and then I will take those questions. Shmuel. Please tell us about your community in Ghana. We seem to have lost connection with them in Ghana at the moment. So if you want to move on to the next speaker, Bonnie. Okay. Now I will go and I will ask Gabrielle to, to please tell us something about the movie and what it is for those few who may not have watched it. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to Kulanu. Uh, for giving, hosting this, uh, this panel, and for all their support on the film, uh, especially Andrea and Harriet, thank you. 
Um, the Doing Jewish, a story from Ghana uh, tells my own story of um, working in Ghana, uh, feeling quite isolated during the Jewish ho high holidays and discovering that there was in fact a Jewish community uh, about a day's journey away. And uh, the filmmaker in me was fascinated by their story. Um, and, you know, I got to know the community members quite deeply and spent a lot of time there. And I, I couldn't help but be somewhat surprised because I was raised to believe uh, that Jews lurk, looked a certain way, were in certain places. And um, I thought, you know, I, I, I think I had my mind blown a little bit. And um, as I got to know their story, I realized that there was an important story to also share on screen, which is that of my unlearning what I thought a Jew was and is. Um, so through this uh, documentary film, there's two versions. The one that some of you watched are, is about 45 minutes and there's one that's a feature length that's 85 minutes. I guess you can depend on how much time you have. <laughs> um, you kind of follow me on my journey to learn about the Sefwis, learn about their history, as well as uh, the desire to connect with Jews around the world, as well as my own journey to understand what is Judaism, what is the Jewish identity, and, and how do we determine who belongs and who doesn't, uh, and why does that matter? So those are some of the questions and themes um, that follow me throughout the journey of the film. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think that's a question that we all deal with. And, uh, Rabbi Eli went in February of this year, right before the pandemic to Sefwi. Please tell us in a few minutes, tell us, well, in a, you have more than a few minutes actually, tell us about your visit. I'll try. Thank you very much, Fanny. Uh, in a sense, especially in light of what I just heard from Gabrielle, I realize all the better how how well somehow we complement <laughs> each other in respect to Ghana. You see, having grown up where uh, the Jew is naturally the underdog, I very much to the contrary was uh, <laughs> since a very early age uh, subject to perceiving the pan-Jewish idea that Jews come in all uh, colors and corners of the world and walks of life. And uh, it became a passion, hopefully that in the positive side, I would not consider it a compulsive behavior, but I really do have that. <laughs> uh, not that there is anything wrong about compulsive, but uh, uh, I do have that urge to always visit more and more Jewish communities, see how they live, how they are about. And I've heard about the Jews of Sefi also for many years. As a matter of fact, wanted to go there for nearly 20 years. And this was an opportunity for which I uh, am very grateful to both Kulano and uh, my own shul, the lodger. Once uh, Kulano got me in touch with the leaders of the Sefi community. I asked, what do you need right now? Is there anything we can help you with? And they said, we need, uh, uh, we need Talitot. Uh, not many people around here have a talus. And we need to fill in. We need to fill a terrace. Uh, we called for a drive. The lodger is a small congregation, but amazingly warm. Believe it or not, uh, nearly one in four families of the lodger have come to donate at least either a talus or to fill in, and many have brought both. So I was well stocked, well packed. I had an <laughs> extra suitcase on my way to Ghana. And uh, um, there I was. Uh, matter of fact, when, uh, when you come, uh, uh, when you come from afar, you expect to be part of a jolly occasion. I don't know, a simcha, a wedding, something, maybe a festival, a yontef. 
I landed right in the middle of a funeral, or so I was told. As a matter of fact, well, from, uh, from Accra, I've gone to Kumasi, and Michael, unfortunately, do we have yet uh, the connection? Has it been reestablished with Sefi? No, well, let's I can, hope. Let me just interrupt to say that I understand what the problem is, and um, we're just asking our IT person uh, to assist, and hopefully they can get on. Right. Thank you. It's uh... also Andrea. Do you understand that there are people who are locked out? We're getting uh, yes. Emails I just heard that, and I don't know why. We have a, our Zoom license is for five hundred, and I've been told people have been locked out. I've asked David if he can address that. So um, I've just I sent him a note asking him to help us out. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So. As uh, Michael came to meet me in Kumasi, very <laughs> selflessly and nobly, and we drove, we slept together all the way to Sefi, took us about three and a half hours by car. He mentioned uh, in passing, apropos, that we are going there for a funeral. And uh, I was not exactly wearing my funeral clothes, as you can see. Can you see my screen? Anybody? Yes, we can. Yes, we can okay. see it. Okay. So, but uh, Michael said, not to worry, you're wearing just the right thing. And uh, a little later, I found out that this was not so much a funeral per se, albeit that's what it's called in Sefi, as a yard site. The actual burial took place uh, nearly a year before. And now, well, this was sort of a memorial service, which, uh, well, if what you have in mind, uh, one of my congregants asked uh, when I said it was uh, very jolly, very wild, he asked, was it like an Irish wake? I said, well, no, Irish wake is to that uh, event what a Tupperware party would be to a Simcha you normally know. Indeed, everything was buzzing, everybody was very warm, very welcome, very, and nobody treated me as a stranger, although I may have been the only strange face, the only person they've never met before. So firstly, you go all around, you shake hands with the entire family, you make everybody's acquaintance, then you sit down in rows and you sit there, and the next bunch of people, the next group that will approach, they will go around shaking all the hands, <laughs> including yours, and then they will put up chairs in front of you. It was a great introduction into what was a few days of sheer pleasure, eye-opening experience, where we we both, we all shared the, the Jews of Sefi. This was my first visit to Ghana ever. And um, apparently, actually, I've been assured repeatedly that I was the first rabbi to visit Sefi ever. So it's it worked both ways. As you can see, we did uh, a number of workshops, varying from uh, putting on how to put on a talus to how to properly speak and enunciate words in Sefi. So that when Shabbos started, I could at least open my address in, uh, in a couple sentences that everybody would understand. Keep the then, how do I put it on? I hold my right hand yeah. still a little above my head yeah. and I make a swiping round yeah. like that yeah. clockwise with my left hand. Yeah. That's right. how I put it first like a hood on my head. Then I take the left edge and I wrap it on my shoulder. Yeah. You take no, the other run, especially face. well for three now. There is special kosher design. I was trying to do jump with you to uh, to show actually the members of the community. 
as you see, those teletot, they, they've just been received and they found very uh, warm and welcoming home there. The perhaps greatest thing, greatest uh, merit, at least from my perspective as a rabbi, an educator and a wandering Jew, is not even the great hospitality and warmth of the community, it is their curiosity, the uh, desire, the yearning to, to learn, to, to know more, the, the craving of knowledge, which uh, enabled, enabled us to share uh, all the more <clears throat> uh, throughout. Uh, can you still see my screen? Sorry, something went blink here. Andrea? No. Nope, my screen's off. Sorry, I'll uh, recharge. <laughs> uh, apologies. There we are. Better now? Yes. Perfect. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this by the way is Joseph, Joseph Nipo. He is the uh, Shamus, you could say, and the caretaker of the grounds, both of the synagogue and the uh, guest house right next to it, where um, I've had the privilege to uh, to stay, sleep, and eat. Uh, Joseph is uh, full of stories and <laughs> jokes. Um, anything he does not know about the history of the community, probably no one does, not even the elders, uh, because he speaks to the elders. Uh, after Shabbat, uh, we had the chance, and I'm just throwing here, rather than building a whole picture, which would take probably way more than 12 minutes, 15 minutes, or five hours, I'm just throwing bits and pieces of uh, information and just short glimpses from various angles into the life of the Jews of Sefi. After the service, so many members of the con congregation agreed to come by and uh, sing for the benefit of a camera so that after Shabbos we could record it, parts of the service, the, the Torah service, the Musaf, the songs, both in Hebrew and we also, that uh, uh, fall in line with their traditional tunes. Just to put things into context, the open door you see, that's a small room which actually serves as the Ark Arona Kodesh. The community has two Torah scrolls, two Sifrei Torah donated by uh, Western congregations. And to put things into context, again, uh, the song you are hearing is the service for taking out of the Torah. 
if uh, you remember Brich Shmei Demare Almach and Be'yana uh, Rachitz, you may be more used to Ashkenazi tunes or perhaps Sephardic tunes if you are of Sephardic persuasion. Well, this is most likely the first time you are hearing it in Sefi, with the probable exception of Gabriel here. The funny thing is, uh, I may have been the uh, the first rabbi in Sefi, but even during my time there, I was not the only Israeli or the only Ashkenazi in Sefi we are. So, as I found out one day into my visit, uh, my uh, uh, my being there. Uh, coincided with the coming of a filming group who were planning to make a documentary on the Jews of Yasso. So most of uh, the videos that you see here were actually recorded by them with professional cameras, professional sound systems, and of course uh, uh, are of much higher quality than anything my Android could offer. Right in the middle, you see uh, Samuel Shmuel Tete, the young Hazan. Um, he is a remarkable young man. He pretty much he's self-taught in Hebrew and in singing, and acts as the official Hazan of Herod Israel. I really, really hope we'll be able to reestablish the connection and meet him. Uh, <laughs> Bonnie, you have questions for the speakers. Do you want to start? And I guess we'll, as soon as we get uh, Shmuel back in, we'll let him present. Mm -hmm. Sure, Rabbi, I will ask you a few questions. Can you share one or two of the most memorable moments or unusual moments during your visit to Sefwi? Ah, <laughs> that's, that's not very easy. I mean, it's not very easy to pick one or two. But, uh, well, firstly, one of the great things that I've been privileged to get and brought with me back from Sefi, besides all the memories and the new friends, is a new name. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have a second name. I never had one. 
And then at one point, by the way, when I say we spent uh, close to a week uh, in constant conversation, I just mean that close to a week in constant conversation, well, bearing sleep time. But uh, we talked, uh, we sat all together and learned together and discussed things uh, during meals and uh, during walks. Uh, and yes, is is the Jewish hallowed uh, custom. We also schmooze occasionally during service. I won't tell anyone if you want. And uh, uh, during one of those occasions, we were six people sitting in the room. So I was there with five members of uh, the Sefi congregation. And accidentally, we found out uh, through just a conversation that weirdly veered off somewhere that way, that all six of us were born on Shabbos. We were all Saturday born, which is not such a huge coincidence. I mean, not miraculous, but still interesting, funny. And then one by one, they start pulling out their local Ghanaian IDs and showing that if not their first, then their second middle, that is name, is Kwame. You see in Ghana, yeah, I see Gabriel nodding. She, she, she knows the, the custom. In Ghana, you get a name, either first or middle name, uh, which corresponds to the day of the day <laughs> which you were born. Uh, if you know Kofi Annan, he's Kofi because he was born on uh, Wednesday, I believe. And if you were born on uh, Sunday, you're Kwasi. And if we were born on Saturday, on Shabbos, the God's Day, you are Kwame. So they're all Kwame and they look at me and they say, you're also Kwame. I accept it. I know they say, I'm also Kwame. They start calling me Rabbi Kwame, half in jest. Maybe, maybe not even half. And then when I get called to the Torah at the synagogue on Shabbos, I got called up as Rabbi Eliyahu Kwame. <laughs> and I accept it. I come up, right? Well, it's been half a year in my congregation at the lodger. When I get an aliyah today, I get called up as Rabbi Eliyahu Kwame. I am Kwame. It is official. That's, that, that's a really lovely story. Um, it, you know, I'd like to go and ask uh, Gabrielle some questions. So we get uh, another point of view on what's happening here. So um, why did you call it doing Jewish? I love that a, name. You know, Reb Zalman talks about doing Jewish. <laughs> Would you like to say, why'd you call it? Uh, I didn't know that actually, but um, we worked long. Uh, we worked long and hard on finding the right title for the film. Um, but essentially, it boiled down to a quote that um, Rabbi Grushko said. Rabbi Grushko is a, um, a sort of a reform rabbi in Montreal, where I had my bat mitzvah, Temple Beth Emanuel, and uh, I really uh, love and respect. Rabbi Grushko, and it was in a phrase that she said in, the, in her interview that uh, if somebody in Ghana is doing Jewish, that really matters to me. And it summarized what I was trying to say about the film, which is seeing Judaism not as something that's inherent and sort of this passive um, thing that you inherit, but, um, but something that is an active verb, you know? Like, what if we saw Judaism as something that required action uh, that was expressed through behavior and through our actions instead of just simply something that is a passive identity. So that's that's sort of the genesis of that idea. So I particularly love the scene when you juxtapose Shabbat in Ghana and Shabbat in Montreal. That to me was such a memorable scene, it's frozen in my memory. So my question, um, is what ways are the Jewish community in Sefwi similar and different to your ex Jewish experiences? Thank you. Um, well, for those who saw the longer version, uh, there is a scene where I, I 
compare and contrast uh, celebrating Shabbat with uh, the Sefli's and celebrating Shabbat with my family in Montreal in a, in a suburb of Montreal. And uh, in the shorter version, that scene was removed. Um, so the, the stark differences were, I would have to say, the tunes that I grew up with around Shabbat, um, Ashkenazi tunes, even though half my family is Sephardic, um, you know, it was interesting. On one hand, uh, as Rabbi Ali showed in the videos, they it, it went into um, their local tunes. But when it came to Shabbat, it was really nice to hear familiarity. Like the tunes sounded familiar to me. Um, the rituals were familiar and the order of the rituals were familiar. Oh, do we have connection? <laughs> Oh, I think we've we've got Shmuel here. Do we? So Shmuel, you're on. Apologies for not having you in right at the beginning. We I understand now what the problem is, and I'm very sorry that we didn't have that addressed earlier. Um, over to you, uh, Bonnie. Hi, Shmuel. We are so happy you were able to join us, oh, even if it'll be for a few minutes. Would you like to tell us something about your community? How many are in it? I know you serve as the Chazan. Tell us something about yourself. Um, tell us how many children you have, how many children are part of the community. Tell us whatever you want to tell us as long as we have a connection. Bezrat uh, Hashem, as it stands, we are 60 members, including children. What denomination are you? Do you have a denominational affiliation? Like, are you Orthodox, Conservative, Reform? How do you view yourself? Okay, as it stands, the Sidhu that we're using is Sirushim Shalom, which is a conservative uh, Sidhu, as it stands. Is your, okay, do you have uh, every, when are your services? Friday night, Shabbos, you have Rosh Chodesh, I know you have the Chagim, the holidays. When when are your services? Okay, in terms of uh, holidays, uh, festivals, or normal services before Shabbat, yeah, we, I, I beg your pardon, I would like you to be clear with, with, with it a little. Um, how often do you hold services? Okay, we hold services on uh, every Friday evening before Shabbat. Uh, if people are not able to make it to the prayer houses, we do it at our various homes. And again, on Shabbat, we do whole service. And again, on uh, festivals too, we do meet now and others. Yeah, sure. Do, do you have Jewish origins. Are you do you, are, do you claim descendancy as a lost tribe? Do you have do you claim Jewish origin, or are you just are uh, you a group that just found Judaism to speak to your heart? Baruch Hashem, uh, a Jew is anyone who was born of a Jewish mother or has undergone conversion to Judaism. According to Halakha, that's the way it's been since biblical times and the family established in the code of Jewish law. But in brief, our history has been that over 200 years ago, people of Sirius were practicing Judaism that were conforming to Torah, Brit Milah, that's uh, Bar Mitzvah, Kashrut laws, and that's it, and others. But when until missionaries stepped forth on our land, Yes, as a missionary step forth on our land. That's when they came, they were able to convince the Canaanites at that time to rubbish the laws, nada, to make it safer for them to live on the land. So they were able to convince the Canaanites at that time to seal their state. So a man by name, Aharon Ahomtret Wachrafa, 1973, had a broad day revelation and was asked by Hashem to bring the people back to Torah. So the mobilization of the people starting in a small town called Sui, which is also a town in Serio, so here. 
So the gathering went on and on and on until 1976, where they migrated to Sevilla, also here at the Emory area, to build a prayer house. So the prayer house, as it stands, is being situated here where we hold services, festivals, and other, and others, yes, okay. as it stands. Can you, can you tell us, while you're talking about your synagogue, can you tell us about the guest house? And I want to hear about the challah covers, the way Kulanu has helped you uh, in developing your community. Bezrat Hashem, as it stands, the uh, prayer house is in function, yes, it's, it's in order, and that's where we normally, or we always go to worship. Besides, we also have a guest house. The guest house is almost in completion. It's left with some small touches, the paintings, some, and another small touches in order for it to work to be fully completed. So we have a guest house which can accommodate uh, uh, visitors or strangers from outside Ghana who are Jews come and then visit us. So as it stands, that's what we have. And our halal cover business, Kulanu has helped the community in diverse ways by helping and sell our product outside Ghana, that's around the world, Jews, and besides the funds which are being raised from the Hana covers are being used to support the community members and also help do other projects within the community. Yes. So um, Plano I will just, has been I will just you some to, of this. Andrea, could you show us some of the Holocaust that their community makes? Can you see it? Oh, as it stands, because of the network. Yeah, the networking system, we've moved, we've relocated, so we are not at the guest house as it stands. We have some at the guest house, but we come to, to Michael's house, we are in Michael's house. Yes, so we've relocated, relocated because of the networking system. So as it stands, we don't have one or some in our possession here, but they are at the guest house, we have some at the guest house, sure. I have a question about what is the role of women in your community? Women are being held in high esteem in our community. In every program and everything we do, we do factor them in order for them also to participate and not be left alone or for them being seen that we've neglected them. No. We factor them or we add them to any or every program that we do in the community here in order for them to be equipped. How do you get new members into in your community? Sure. How, how do you get new members? Sure. Like who do people marry? Okay, as it stands, the our women are already married and the young ladies are schooling. For that matter, uh, the young guys, those who are not yet married, are waiting or they are preparing. And even if they marry outside, they have to marry someone whom they can help them practice or help in the religion very well, not to go and marry any other member outside, which will bring a conflict, yes, or wouldn't help the man worship Hashem. So, natural fact that the, the ladies or the women that we are with them here, they are young and they are not mature that much to be here yeah, to marry. So, the, the, the guys or those who, who are yet to marry are waiting so that they are of age to marry, then they marry them. Okay, so here's a tricky question. Can you turn the camera around so we can see people who are with you? 
Okay, ma'am. Okay, so we're almost half of the community members are here um, because of uh, the, 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 the room where we are now, the numerical space, not everyone can come inside. So others are not around, but I can say that yes, some almost yes. I'm encouraging no more friends with me here. Just sit in one place and let yeah, them they come can, to okay. you. They let can walk to the camera. And let them come to you so we can say hello. Okay. okay. So I beg your pardon, okay. you can let all draw come. closer to me. You can all come to me so that you say hello to each and everyone here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So if you know, they just if yes, they just come up come and get in front of the yes, camera. Yes, Hans Michael has connected it on the screen. Yes. Can you just invite them to come up yeah. to the camera? That's yeah, it. Yeah, now, see yes. Let them I'm come. going to stand in front of them so that no, but you, you just uh, leave the, the camera. Time. Leave the computer where it is. Samuel, leave the computer okay. where it is. Just let people come behind you. Okay. Can okay. you sit down? Sit down, you leave the last the and they can come. Yeah. Okay. You okay. wanted to say hello. Hello. Shalom. Shalom. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Bonita oh, wants each and everyone to say hello. Yes, hello. thank you. Shalom, shalom. shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. What you're doing terrific. Could I just ask Bonnie? Yes. There is one question that we'd like to have answered, and that is maybe Shmuel can tell us how the um, Smartphones are being used that we provided for them to study uh, Judaism. Uh, okay, the smartphones that were sent to us, we use it in diverse ways. First of all, we've created yes platforms which we use to learn Torah, and we also have platforms which we also use to disseminate information. An individual can also go on the internet and then do research, yes, about our service and stuff. So the smartphones are being used in diverse ways, which is of help to each and everyone in the community. Thank you. We thank uh, Kulanu Canada for their kind gesture and what they did for our community. So we we, we, we ask, much grateful and we do appreciate what you do for us. I want to ask a question of of um, Gabrielle and Rabbi Eli and yourself. What can we okay. do to support your community in Safwe? What can we do to help you? Gabrielle, you want to start? With the Oh, it's not a shame. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. Our community need very in order for us to try. Point number one. We need we need sustainable jobs. Okay. Shmuel, I'm going to turn to other people because your screen froze. Gabrielle, what can we do? And Rabbi Eli, after that, what can we do to help the community in Sefwi? May and I make a short suggestion? I don't know who's speaking, but sure. <laughs> um, sending them programs that they could access any time that we know about that are Judaic programs. For example, my synagogue of Beth Sedek has done this every Shabbat, a service. There are many programs in Canada that we could perhaps maybe would be useful to them. That's a very interesting idea, like a recorded service. There are many recorded services. That's true. Rabbi Ali records his too, I've seen it. Rabbi, Rabbi, what do you think about that idea? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, I think 
stay in touch with a number of the community members in SEFI. And I do share with them the links to our services. So uh -huh. they have been ever since the, the plague started. I think one of the main things that I perhaps Shmuel was getting at was, uh, or Michael, sorry, was getting at was um, the need for sustainable resource and resource development in the community. Uh, I know that the um, that the Hala covers and some of the artifacts that the community creates, the money earned from that does help build um, sustainable business solutions for the community. Uh, and enables them effectively to find revenue generation tools for the community that allow them to not necessarily always depend on charity for development, but to actually help empower themselves economically. And I think it's important to see our work as Jews as you know, plugging into a system that makes sure that Jews are healthy, Jews have access to communication tools, Jews have access to information, uh, health and jobs. Uh, so I would say you know, when I was there on the ground, a very big, uh, you know, beat <laughs> or drum that that Alex was beating and that others were beating is this idea of developing some initial investments in small, uh, sustainable businesses that can bring in uh, income, particularly to pay for school and to have, make sure the next generation um, can uplift the Sefwis even more. Could you, Gabrielle, you, speak about the uh, guest house? I assume you both stayed there. And at the beginning, I heard Shmuel say they still need to finish it. Is the guest house, which can I understand house up to six people, is that a potential revenue source that, that would be helpful for the community? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say there is a tendency for a lot of, I don't know, Rabbi, maybe you can confirm this, but when I was there, there was a tendency because when you travel in Ghana, things are quite cheap for people on the Canadian dollar. Uh, there's a tendency to sort of pay, you know, what would be at market in Sefuiwiyaso, which is not very much. And I would encourage anyone who does go to visit um, to see the guest house as an income source because of how well they take care of you. And, um, you know, they provide you with meals, they help you around, they make you feel like, a, you know, comfortable when you're actually uh, feeling like a stranger. And um, I would say that is a, like a really big income potential for them uh, since so many Jewish people since the film and you know, since articles from Kulanu have discovered the Sefi community. Rabbi Eli, and what can you say about Jewish development there? Well, as I said before, I guess I mentioned the uh, curiosity, the propensity towards asking questions and learning more and more is the main resource and a huge potential for the Jewish community of Sefi. And uh, indeed they have uh, no less than three different online classes and ongoing discussions, mostly through WhatsApp. Again, as you can see, the bandwidth uh, can be rather narrow, so not, not that much by way of regular video resources or anything of the kind, but uh, they are, the people are extremely hungry. They are eager to imbibe whatever they can reach. And uh, as Shmuel himself said, uh, Baruch Hashem and Bezrat Hashem, uh, these days with the marvels of modern technologies, there is a whole lot of resources to make uh, anything and everything generally available to the Jewish world, available to the Jews of Sefwi. Just uh, <laughs> not sure if that's uh, the greatest connection, but if I may share one moment that was extremely surrealistic. It kind of blew my mind to put it in the vernacular. It happened on uh, uh, Friday night on Leil Shabbos, right after the service at the synagogue. I left with uh, three or four 
congregants. We were walking down the road, walking down the path and just conversing, did, discussing something. And then very clearly in front of me, uh, I see in the, in the moonlight, the silhouette of a tall Hasidic man with a strimalon walking away from me. And no, I am not prone to hallucinations. It was so surrealistic, so unbelievable, right there in the Ghanaian backcountry on a Friday night. I pinched myself, but the sight did not go away, so quickened the pace and caught up with him. And sure enough, you may have known what was coming. It was a tall African uh, Ghanaian woman walking with a, <laughs> with a basket on, on her head and looking very much like a strimal wearing Hasid. But uh, that, that, very, that very sense, <laughs> even the feeling that I was able or prepared to see a Jew from a very different uh, cultural setup <laughs> uh, put me in a very special mood, I must say, that, uh, that Saturday night. So I did share it with, uh, with my interlocutors, with the new friends that I just le left the show with, which of course led to a whole set of other questions of uh, what is the traditional Hasidic garb? Where did that come from? And uh, how and why are they different? Okay, it I think we're at the, two, we're a little past the two o'clock mark. Do we uh -huh. want to wrap up, Andrea? Um, I really wanted to ask Gabrielle a final question. What was her takeaway from the, what do you want us to take away from the movie? And I have also asked Molly if we want to stay to see a three minute, the three minute trailer of Gabrielle's movie to encourage people to want to, um, uh, to see it. Um, Gabrielle. So, and then Andrea will have closing remarks. Is that okay, okay. Andrea? Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, okay, that's a great question. Um, what I hope for folks to take away from the film, particularly uh, now that um, I find hearing about communities of Jews all around the world uh, in places that we deemed uh, unexpected, I think we have more of a knowledge and awareness now uh, that there is diversity in the Jewish community. Uh, what I'm hoping is that people will join me on my journey of not just learning more about Judaism, but unlearning some of the things that maybe we grew up with as Jews in, you know, Montreal, New York, <laughs> all the little cities, and to see how we uh, can make Judaism more inclusive, um, how we as Jews can make sure that everyone feels like they belong regardless of how we define Judaism um, and how we in our own congregations, what we can do to actually make the lives of Jews of color, for instance, easier and show up uh, for Jews of color and um, yeah, strengthen our family all around the world. That's what really touched me. And I, I think that's why I'm interested in the work that Kulanu does as well. Thank you. I knew that would be a perfect closing segment. Molly, would you like to show the trailer? And then Andrea, you'll come on for a few words. Thank you. So you know those people looking for meaning in their lives so they get up and go volunteer in Africa? I'm Gabrielle, one of those people. So I'm living my life in Ghana, but then I realize the Jewish New Year is just around the corner. And well, the thought of finding another Jew seems impossible. Yo, shalom. In the beginning, I don't know that there are Jewish people even outside. Now I have been introduced to the world. My dream is to become a full rabbi to my community. My dream is to study Judaism, teach my people, so that they can not forget our uh, tradition, our Judaism, and to better people's lives. 
ti no mo yere dada but na nobody knows to say eh yeah Judaism eh so how did Jewish customs make their way here without the Jewish name? I believe the Jews in Ghana are the lost, lost ten tribes of Israel. When you have uh, one of these lost tribes, I think the word lost is the key to it, that you have a break in the chain, and that makes it difficult to authenticate their Jewishness. We are claiming that we are Jewish people. And Jewish people, you cannot be here alone in Ghana and say you are Jewish people, unless you look for your brothers and sisters who are outside there. It's very hard for people to believe that true did their Jew. Judaism is somehow not black. Like last I checked, no one has like a genealogy book in their back pocket, like tracing all the way back to like one of the 12 tribes. No one has that. You're such a small percentage of the population that it's hard to do it on your own. You know, you're going against everybody, everybody and everything out there. So you need other people. I think we're here alone, but now we are all coming together as one people. Seeing them understand the Torah and sense of appreciating Judaism, feeling it's such a, a privilege and something that they had to work so hard to get, whereas in this country so many of us have such access and don't even care. There is that feeling of responsibility for other Jews, regardless of labels. So the notion that there might be somebody in Ghana who's doing Jewish, that's very moving to me, right? I, I care about that. No matter how many bagels and cream cheese you eat, Purim parties you attend, if you don't live the life, it's very, very difficult to pass it on to the next generation. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone that's participated, specifically thank Shmuel and his community for engaging with us. I'm so sorry that the connection was so bad. We so appreciate the effort that you went to to participate and I hope that you saw some of the program. We will certainly have the recording available to everybody that was here today and on those who missed it. But I will let you know that an edited version of the recording will be posted on both the Kulano Canada website and the Kulano US website within the next couple of days. Thank you, Bonnie, for putting a lot of time and energy into helping us create this program and to Molly and Harriet. I want to um, thank Rabbi Ellie for making the connection on a very human level and uh, again for bringing the, the uh, color covers back to us because uh, people will get in touch if they want to order them. And I want to also remind people that, as you heard, there are many ways we can help these communities, both in Ghana and elsewhere around the world. And to tell you, there are many Jewish communities in Africa. If you haven't thought about it, Google it. Either go to the kulano.org site or simply Google Kenya Jews, Ghana Jews, Ivory Coast Jews. You will be surprised. There are millions of people who have yet to be recognized by the what we call mainstream. Uh, the mainstream is going to be, as Gabrielle said, far more inclusive. So on that note, please support us. We can all do more. We can help the Sefwi Wiwaso and others. Thank you and have a great day. Can I ask a question to the rabbi? Yes. Uh, rabbi Eli, can I ask a question for you? I was wondering about circumcision. Do they make circumcision? Do they have a mohel? Um, no, they do not have a trained mohel. They uh, they have uh, a couple of medical in the in the community. And actually, it's a great question, which probably would have been one of the address to Milano members. Do you want to answer that question? Shmuel? Do you want to answer the question about circumcision? Oh. Um, I think Shmuel's sound is off. Just quickly, um, Kulana was about to organize uh, a special Pan-African uh, jury uh, seminar, uh, which would also train some of the community members, including members of SEPI community. 
that would be uh, going there uh, to, to do Mila, to do circumcision. Unfortunately, the uh, COVID-19 pandemics <clears throat> has curbed those plans. So it's all kind of up in the air at the moment. Alan, you had a question? Yes, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, providing us with this wonderful insight and inf information on a community that we never knew existed. And uh, I, I appreciate all of your efforts and I hope to follow it up by learning as much as I can about this community in, in Ghana. I have a, a comment and a question for Rabbi Courant. First of all, it's a pleasure to see my former rabbi and my mentor from St. Catharines once again. I always appreciated all the things that you were able to teach me and apparently continue to. I wondered about any uh, possibility of the community in Ghana following any of the rules of Kashru. Is this part and parcel of their of their uh, Judaism, or or is it, or have they not reached that point yet? Hello, Alan and Dorothy. Hello. Lovely seeing you both. Hello. Hello. And uh, a true pleasure, hopefully soon in person. Kashrut has indeed been part and parcel of uh, uh, the life of uh, the Jews in, uh, in Sefri for many years. In fact, some of the traditions, we, we can discuss then the level of Kashrut, for instance, uh, Many of them will uh, today, when there is no reliable way of uh, getting meat from without, will rely on self-slaughter. And some even will go to a Muslim halal shop as being the nearest. But uh, uh, most everybody observes kashrut in one fashion or another. For instance, there is a very interesting custom, a practice which apparently goes many decades back. Um, on Shabbat, many of the Sefwi Jews do not eat meat at all. And that's because the refrigeration uh, reached that part of the world rather later than, say, uh, Canada. And before refrigeration, you had to shecht, you had to slaughter and uh, worked out and eat right away. Process and eat the meat <laughs> within the day. You couldn't do it on Shabbos. So you became vegetarian on Shabbos. For the same reason, for many, many decades, there were apparently no cows in that part of Ghana. So the Jews uh, had the tradition of eating mostly smaller animals like sheep and goats, as well as poultry. So yes, definitely kashrut is one of the staple trademarks. Uh, I know you would put a pun in here, Alan, but uh, one of the <laughs> staple <laughs> trademarks that uh, distinguish the Jewish community in the place. Good to see you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, would you like to wrap up, or can we have final remarks? I have a question before you do that, Anna Bloom. How much are the color covers? The color covers, are you in Canada or the US? Canada. In Canada, they are $40. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to do a little wrap up. And I, this program was very exciting because you all got a chance to visit live Ghana uh, without going on an airplane. And you see, you could see just from the difficulty of transmission, how different our lives are, but yet how similar they are. And the movie brings up the point very well. Jewish. The, the closing statement for people who want to learn about this, please go to the Kulanu webpage. We have, uh, we deal in 33 countries, far away, we have communities all over the world uh, that are emerging for different regions, we have, and some claim Jewish origin, 
And um, I hope that you will get to learn more about returning emerging groups and the work that Pilates does around the globe. Oh, we're also going to have two more. Um, if you go to the Kulanu webpage, there are two more Zoom sessions that we're setting up. One is November 5th that has to deal with um, a, a backstory of Operation Moses, which is the Ethiopian story. Uh, we have someone who will talk about uh, dr pr um, driving people through the night, through the, through the desert <clears throat> to get them out. Um, and he will <clears throat> bring his translator as well as a girl that I think he, he helped rescue. And we will have a program on women entrepreneurs in Uganda that do sewing projects such as um, reusable sanitary napkins, soap, and COVID masks. So I hope you all register for this. And it was great doing this. And thank you, everyone. Have a healthy and good year. Stay awesome. safe. Bye for now.